So thanks for having me, and uh, what a tough uh, act to follow. That's good. I'll, <laughs> I'll try to be a pub, but you know, <laughs> that's gonna be tough. Well, um, my name is Philip. Uh, I'm uh, from Denmark, as uh, as Paul said. Um, well, yeah, I won't say anything, say anything but think about that. I work at a company called Impact, uh, where we do uh, e-commerce uh, for large corporations, uh, mainly Danish or Scandinavian ones, so you probably won't know them, but maybe some of them. Um, but enough about that. Uh, last year, I was uh, fortunate enough to be accepted into Google's uh, Developer Expert program. Uh, but this talk is not really supposed to be about me, so I'll skip this really quick. But just mention that uh, I work with the, with the Angular team and the Polymer team and the Chrome team and stuff. So you have, if you have feedback, uh, come, please come talk to me in the break. And uh, I'd love to get feedback from, uh, from, from real developers. Uh, I also run a local uh, Angular user group um, back in Aarhus. So if, you're, if you ever want to go to Denmark and if you, you want to talk, uh, find me on Twitter. And uh, we love to have uh, foreigners come and talk for us as well. So. That's the introduction. So, so the title of this talk is uh, Front-end Development of the Future, of the Current Future, uh, because, as you know, the, it changes all the time. So this is kind of a, how I think it's going to be and uh, with what I know today, and uh, it might change tomorrow, but this is just my take on it. Uh, what did I just do? <laughs> Click the wrong button? Yeah. OK. So this talk is about all of these th things. Uh, I, I talked to somebody uh, last night, and I was like, so my talk is about everything that has web in its name, and it's kind of new. Um, so I'll introduce a lot of uh, new APIs and new stuff. And um, there's going to be a lot of links in my slides, so I'll ma make sure to sh share, my, share my slides afterwards. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, or you can, uh, yeah, I'll post it in the, in the Slack channel or something. Um, but obviously, we start out with web versus native. You know, we've, we've seen this uh, probably everywhere, you know, to, so the web is good because it's only one platform, it's only one language. There's no app stores, no gatekeepers, uh, nobody to approve your app or something. And it's really easy to deploy, and we have the link, so, you know, we can reflect any state of our application into an, a URL, and you can share that URL via a text message or something, and somebody else can click the same URL and go straight into the app where you're at. And like, native apps are still, comp like, they're still having a really hard time with this, because it's so hard to, com to, uh, to compete against. But then again, we've, like, on native, we've, we've had better performance, we've had more hardware access, we've been able to do offline, you know, re-engagement, all this kind of cool stuff. Uh, but the web now has an answer for this, finally. And I, I, I guess you've probably heard about this before. Uh, there was a mention of it before. You know, we, we call it progressive web apps. Uh, the idea is that we want to make apps that are reliable, that are fast, and that are engaging. Um, and uh, yeah, here's the first link. All the links are going to be in the bottom of the screen, so, so it won't disturb. So really, all these things are not, no longer just for native. We can do all of these on the web now. Um, and the, an important thing to note is that this is not, it's not a new framework. It's more of a philosophy. It's more of a way to think about things. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's no framework here. There's no library that you have to use or have to learn to understand. It's just a couple of new browser APIs, and, uh, and you have superpowers. Uh, even though you just have regular powers as a developer, the platform will actually give you superpowers. Uh, so, um, so yeah, the first one I mentioned was performance. Uh, well. You know, the browser and the DOM has, has, uh, has a pretty bad reputation. Like, everybody has been saying the DOM is slow and browsers are slow, but it's, it's, they're really not. Like, if, 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 you, if you know how to do it, if you know what parts to, to animate or what part, how to make your, your JavaScript or what, what parts of JavaScript not to use, you can actually make really performing web apps. Um, so last year, or the year before that, I think, uh, Google kind of released this idea of, of rail for performance, where you think about response, animation, idle, and load. And uh, so it's a really good way to think of your animation, or of your, of your performance. So make sure that you respond to, inter to interactions within a really short time. Uh, make sure your animations run with 60 FPS. And there's, like, if you click the link, there's a lot of good articles that will help you do this. Um, and another thing that was launched last year was uh, for the purple pattern. Uh, it, I think it, was, it came out of the Polymer uh, community, where it's like, uh, so you should push all your critical resources down. Maybe you can use HTTP push, uh, or, or you can just you know, put, it, put, them, put, them, put your styles in line or do something so you can actually get something on the screen really fast. 
Uh, you should render the initial route on the server. Uh, you should only you should pre cache or and preload everything as it like when the first load when the when the first route has loaded, so you can you can get a really fir quick first load. And you should lazy load all the rest of it. So again, there's a link. Go read more about that if you want. Um, then there's hardware access. So hardware access used to be a native only thing. Now all these APIs are available in the browser. Uh, so we can do camera detection. We can even do face detection and sh shape detection. We can do QR, QR code uh, scanning. We can do all that with native uh, JavaScript. Uh, we can do you know, full screen, web audio, web GL, web Bluetooth, uh, VR, geolocation. All of these are available today in, uh, in modern browsers. Uh, and uh, I think we've, we kind of closed that gap as well. Um, the, the, the last thing is, uh, is typically what we talk about when we talk about uh, progressive web apps, offline and re-engagement. And I thought I'd just spend just a little bit of time about it. Um, so it's, the idea is that uh, there is a service worker. Uh, the service worker is kind of like a, a regular JavaScript worker, which means it runs on a different thread and it's, it's not, it doesn't mess with the UI thread. But the difference is that it's, uh, there's only one per host. So, if, um, so like, even if you have multiple windows open with the same page in it, there's still just one service worker. Uh, and, it wor and it lives beyond the session, which means even after you close the browser, the service worker will still be, will still be running. Uh, and, you, and that means from, the, from your server, you can probably send a push message and the service worker will, will wake up, receive the push message, and then you as a programmer can, can say, decide what should happen now. Should we show a notification or should we just get data in the background or should we do whatever? Um, yeah, it gives you a persistent programmable cache. So like, if you've been doing uh, cache stuff, you know caching is really hard with HTTP, so what does it mean if there's a if there's a no cache header and an expires uh, date? Does anybody know which one takes? You know, if you really don't know. Um, so the a, a part of service worker is that it gives you a programmable cache, so you can actually say, so store this URL, store it, you can, uh, yeah, and you can interact with it. So it's, it's based around events and promises, and I thought I would put some, some, uh, some code in as well so we can, we can actually just see with it. Uh, so, I won't go too much into this, just showing you that it's very event-based, so you can just listen for a fetch event. So what, what we do here is say, so every time the, the website that has my service worker on it, every time it does a, an HTTP request, so every time there's a fetch event, uh, before it actually goes off to the server, my service worker wakes up, uh, and it can choose to respond to it. So in this example here, I'm opening the cache and seeing if there, is a if there is already a match in the cache, we'll just serve that. And if not, we'll just fall back to actually fetching it on the server. So this is a really you know, eight-line JavaScript code to actually have uh, offline support for your application. So it's, it's, it's so easy to get, to get started with this. And obviously, there's a lot of frameworks built on top of this if you want to. Uh, you see there's a link down here to something called Service Worker Toolbox, uh, where you can get uh, you know, express-like Syntax where you can say, so all routes that match this pattern should be cached with this strategy where you ask the server first, but if it doesn't respond, we respond with from the server or from the cache. Or you, like you can do multiple strategies based on, on, on the routes. Uh, and yeah, I put some more code in here just so you can uh, see it when you, when you actually look at my slides. But you can do, this is how you listen for push events. Uh, or no, this is how you listen for sync events where you can say, do this the next time you're, you're online. Uh, so if you're, if you're using this app offline, uh, you can register for a sync event, and then the next time the browser is online, uh, this will actually happen even, af even after you close the website. So imagine you're doing a, a chatting service or an email service, and somebody's writing a response, and then they're in the, in the inside of the tunnel, and they press send. Uh, so now with this, we can just register for a sync event, and then when you're out of the tunnel again, the, the web app will wake up and send it in the background, and you don't have to notice it. So it's super cool new features. Uh, yeah, listening for push events, showing notifications, um, listening for whenever people actually interact with the notification. So if they click, so I want to buy this thing straight from the notification, you don't even have to open the website. You can just respond to it with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, an event, uh, you know, send it to the server or whatever you want to do. 
Progressive web apps are installable, which means uh, you can add them to the home screen, you can get a real nice icon, you can get a, a splash screen while you're, while you're loading it. You can actually load it in, in full screen so you don't have to all the, the browser Chrome takes up uh, your space. And if you're on Android, uh, we can actually do even better. So if, if you're on, a, on the newest version of Android with current version of Chrome, I think, and you install a, a, a PWA or a progressive web app onto your, onto your device, it's no longer called uh, add to home screen, it's called install, because it's actually, it'll actually take your application and wrap it in an, in a, in an, in an APK, which is the Android uh, packaging format. Uh, and that means it'll actually show up like a regular uh, Angular, uh, Android application. So it will show you how much memory it takes, how much battery it's been taking, uh, what services it's, it has been using in the background, and all the stuff that you're used to from native apps. You have that in, in, um, in web apps now as well. So it's, it's pretty cool, and I think, I think we'll see a trend where in the future probably end users won't even know the difference between what's a web app and what's a native app. So, well, at least that's my guess. So if you want to, like this was mentioned a little bit earlier, where they said if you want to be really, if you want to get really down, you should just check any of your websites with the Lightbox simulator, and uh, I agree. It's really hard to get a perfect score, uh, and you don't necessarily have to aim for a perfect score. Uh, but it is a good tool. It gives you a lot of, uh, a lot of ideas on, on what to work on next. Uh, it's a browser extension, to, and it's actually going to eventually be built into DevTools in Chrome. Uh, so you can do, a, it's going to be the audits panel. What's the audits panel now is going to be Lighthouse. And it'll check to see if it works offline. It'll check to see if it does, you know, all the stuff that you should, loads fast, uh, be, is secure and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, I built a demo of it just, to, just because I, I thought it would be fun to see if I can get 100 on the, on the score. So I built a, a snake game, which is you, you can control it with your keyboard arrow, or you can control it with sliding. And it's kind of fun. Uh, it does nothing. Like, if you want to build a high score, please do, and uh, it's an open source project, so <laughs> it's, it's always fun. Uh, but it's called Progressive Snake, and it, it's actually pretty close to 100. Uh, it was 100 when it started. I'm not sure if it's anymore, because you know, the, the requirements always change. Uh, and uh, last week, uh, somebody build, built a, a, a fidget spinner. I think it was Sam Sacconi from Google. Uh, just to just, just see, like, you can actually have things that perform really well, uh, that does a little bit complex UI, and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's actually kind of fun to play with. Uh, so go ahead and try that as well, fidgetspin.xyz. So now that we said superpowers, with great powers comes great responsibility, uh, you know, so we, all of these features are only available on, H on HTTPS. Because like, when you can register stuff that lives in the background, or if you can do stuff that's really, really powerful, uh, you want to protect yourself against the man-in-the-middle attacks and all the, and on the, all the worst attacks. Uh, so they all you have to use HTTPS. It's, it's pretty easy now with Let's Encrypt. Uh, if you don't know what that is, come you can check it out or come talk to me. Uh, it can work on local host, though, so if you, don't, you don't need to have certificates for, 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 for developing it. Um, and talking about HTTPS, uh, so eventually we want to do it so Chrome shows a not secure banner right next to the URL when, uh, when, when, you're, when you're not on HTTPS. But, uh, but for now, we don't want, like, because there's still so many sites not using HTTPS. For now, we, uh, in January, we changed it so if there's a password field or a credit card field on, on a page and it's not on HTTPS, we'll show a warning. It's, not, it's still not yet read but it's, it's going to be uh, later, uh, and eventually it will be uh, for all pages when they're not on HTTPS. Uh, so, but beware, if, like, if you're using anything that's not on HTTPS, uh, transition, it's, it should be relatively easy, and, it's, uh, and it's, a, it's a huge win, and you owe it to your users. Yep, HTTP2, I don't want to say too much about this, but uh, it gives a lot of new powers to you, uh, where you can actually uh, do multiplex, um, so you can do parallel requests and, uh, and all the same from just one connection. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm short in time, so I'm moving really fast. Uh, so JavaScript, ECMAScript is obviously the standard. Um, there's a lot of new stuff going on. Like we, we've all seen probably ECMAScript 6 or ES6, where there's a lot of new features. And I, I did this on purpose where the last line is cut in half, because there's so many more features in ES6. Um, and uh, like. 
But ES6 took like eight years or something to actually land, uh, and we, we didn't want to continue with that. So uh, going on, it's going to be a new version of ECMAScript standard every year. So ES2016 uh, has only two features, and they're kind of small. Uh, so there's an includes operator on the, on the array, and you can do an exponential operator, so you can do two in the power of two, uh, a little easier. Uh, and uh, 2017, well, it's obviously not done yet, but it looks like it'll be mostly around some of the async await stuff that we heard about yesterday, and, uh, and some, uh, some new methods and objects. Uh, but it's still relatively small, but it means we can, we can move much faster, and uh, if a feature is, is on the way to becoming in the standard, and it's, uh, it's a little bit late, it doesn't delay the entire standard, it'll just it just won't make it into 2017, it'll be in 2018. So it's a, it's a really cool thing that it's, it's going to enable us to, to work a lot faster on JavaScript. Yeah, so I just thought I would put in a, in a class and that actually kind of assembles all of this. So this is a push subscription manager where you can subscribe to push events and it'll actually, you know, show a notification and uh, do all this stuff. Uh, and it's in a class and it's, you know, using destructuring and all the new kind of features. Uh, so look at this when you look at the slides later. So, obviously we do uh, e-commerce, as I said, so we're pretty excited about the browsers actually uh, implementing a new um, feature called payment request, which is, uh, the idea is we have huge thumbs and, uh, and we still try to do mobile checkout with a bunch of forms, and that doesn't never work, because you, know, you can't spell your name right, uh, you, you make mistakes, and you, you, you don't want to do it. Like, I, I see myself finding a product and on my phone, because I'm researching from the couch or whatever, and then I'll email myself the link, so I'll go buy it on my desktop uh, tomorrow when I go to the office or something. And we want to get rid of that, because we want people to uh, obviously to, to shop right away. Um, so Google's been uh, introducing this new API where the browser will actually pre-fill a payment request a form for you. It'll give you, it knows where you, where you live, it knows what credit card you usually pay, pay with. And by the end of it, you'll press pay, and all you have to do manually is type in the back of the credit card so we, don't, so we won't have any fraud, uh, and you're done. So this, this feature is already in, in stable Chrome, so it's, it's on Chrome on your Android device. Uh, it's, um, it's currently on, uh, in the Canary channel for, uh, uh, for desktop, uh, but it's already in Firefox and in Edge, and it's, like, it's, it's already gaining momentum. Um, and uh, I, I see so much potential in this. Uh, so I built uh, this demo, uh, I put it up, so I just put some more slides in of it if the video didn't work. Uh, but the code is kind of easy, like it's built around promises, it's built around events. So it seems like that's how all the new APIs are gonna be built. Um, so we can say, make a new payment request, line one, give it some options, uh, then in line 15 we say request.show, which will pull up the UI, uh, and then we can listen for events, so whenever the shipping address change, maybe put some new shipping options in there, whenever the shipping options change, maybe recalculate the price or whatever, uh, but you can do all of this and it's, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, put together a demo, you can go play with it. Uh, if, you, if you have an Android device, it, it works right out of the box in your stable Chrome browser. Uh, and the source is available there as well. Uh, which leads me to authentication, uh, which is another thing where it's like on mobile, typing in complex passwords with the lowercase and uppercase and weird numbers and weird signs and all that stuff. It's so hard, uh, and it shouldn't be. Because, you know, uh, our browsers, they can usually help us fill out the forms, uh, and we might even have a password manager or something. Uh, but we as a developer, we should, we should have access to that. Like, obviously we shouldn't have clear access to po people's passwords if they don't want us to have it. Uh, but we should be able to say, try to just do a login. Uh, and that's what uh, authentication, the new credential management API will actually give us. So when people log in or sign up or something, you can say, you can call a little uh, piece of JavaScript, I think it's on, uh, you can call a little a piece of JavaScript here, you see, uh, I make a new password credential in line two, and then in line six, I say store this, and when I do this, the browser will, will say, uh, do you want to store this? So they'll ask the user, and if he says yes, it'll store it on the, on the, on the client, and, um, and then the browser, uh, you know, if, if you use the same browser on multiple clients, uh, the browser might sync it for you, uh, like it syncs everything else for you, so if you're logged into one device, you're automatically logged into all your devices. Uh, if you save your login for one device, it's already all automatically on all your devices. Uh, super cool new features. Um, of course, if you want to click, if you click the logout button, you should no longer be automatically signed in because you've 
which that would kind of defeat the purpose of signing out. Um, so if you do that, you can no longer automatically sign in. So if you, if you then want to try to sign in, uh, we can we can actually present you with a UI that says, so you, the last time you signed in, you signed in with this user. Do you want to do that again? Um, so a lot of cool stuff. It also works with, uh, with federated logins. So if you're using your Facebook login or your Twitter login or your Google login or whatever, uh, we can save all that information in the browser as well. Because I know for me, services where I have three different accounts, because I don't remember if I've signed up with Facebook or with uh, GitHub or with Twitter or with a regular account. So now the, the browser can actually store this information for me and make sure that I, I only have one account because you know which one to use. Um, and I thought I I'd show you a video of that as well. So in the video, you'll see me uh, signing up for a profile. The browser will ask me to store it. Uh, I will then reload the page, which makes me, like in this example, it loses my session. So after just a half a second or something, it will automatically sign me back in because uh, uh, it's allowed to. Then I'll press the sign out button and reload the page, losing my session. And then it won't automatically sign me in because I just actively signed out. Then when I press the sign in, but the sign back in button, uh, it'll ask me which profile to use. So, so keep along, see here. So I sign up, register with whatever. The browser asks me, do I, do I want to save it? Yes, I do. I'll reload the page. I'm signed out. I'm automatically signed back in. I press the sign out button, I reload, I'm no longer automatically signed in. And when I press sign in, I'm showed a UI that says, do you want to just sign in with the account that we already know? So this is going to be the future of, uh, of authentication. Uh, it's in Chrome uh, today. It's in Chrome today uh, on Android and on desktop. Uh, and it's really powerful and it's super easy. And with payment requests and authentication, th like, they're so good candidates for progressive enhancement. So like. The code to do it is so small, and it's so simple to use. And you just put an if statement around it saying, so if the browser supports this, offer it. And if they don't, you know, they just get the regular exp uh, experience. So you should do it. Uh, you can more or less just copy my code, and it, and it will work out of the box. There, there's a demo and some code here as well. Uh, so, so check out the slides afterwards. Then there's web components. So you know, React. Angular, Vue, all of the popular frameworks, they, they have some kind of idea of a component that where you can encapsulate some logic and maybe some UI and you can reuse it and stuff. And uh, you know, the browser's been paying attention and now there's, a, there's an official way to do components in the browser, so you don't need a framework for it anymore. Um, you know, so you can just do show me the mini basket and the, the, we'll have all the events that we're used to from React or Angular. So this is when it's put in the DOM, this is when it's created, this is when, it's, when the properties have changed, this is when it's taken back out, all the stuff. You have all these events with native uh, web components. Uh, so I talked to, uh, and this, there are four specs really, but you know, go read them if you want. Uh, I talked to somebody, uh, I think in the, in the lunch break, and they were like, so who really uses Polymer? Uh, so Polymer is a framework that's built around web components, uh, around native components. It's, it's a very small library because all it does is, is give you a little bit of data binding stuff and all, uh, some of the stuff that's not yet in the standard. Uh, but like, the goal of Polymer really is uh, to eventually fade away and not be necessary anymore because the browser will support all of it. Um, so who really uses uh, Polymer? Uh, does anybody serious use it? And I was like, yeah, so if you've been to McDonald's recently, they, all the new uh, signs, they're made with Polymer components. Uh, if you go to the new YouTube version, it's built with Polymer, probably the biggest website in the world or the one with the most traffic. Um, even if you go to Chrome settings, so it's, it's on two billion devices, it's built with Polymer. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, it's probably the, 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 the website that's in most places, Chrome settings. Um, so now that I'm just running through uh, stuff, I, th I thought I should talk about something that wasn't JavaScript, even though I know it says JS Heroes, but I guess it's kind of web, web heroes. Uh, so style, you know, a lot of stuff has happened. Do we, should we have styles in CSS or not, or in JavaScript or not, or how should we handle it? Uh, I won't go into that discussion. <laughs> um, but I will talk about three things. I'll talk about uh, custom properties, I'll talk about grid, and about Houdini. So custom properties are like variables. So if you, if you, if you know CSS, if you've been using CSS, you probably use some kind of preprocessor, maybe SAS or less or something, because you want to be able to 
have variables and do nesting and stuff. Like, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Google that as well, because that's going to help you so much. Uh, but uh, you, you might know it already. Uh, but custom properties are like CSS variables, uh, or like SAS variables, but they're at runtime, which means you can, you can change, change the value uh, of a variable, and it's going to propagate down through the entire tree, uh, and you can do that at runtime. So that's really cool, and especially because it's you know, the, the idea of CSS it's th that it inherits. So you can say from this point on and down in this branch of my DOM, uh, this, va this variable is now green instead of blue, uh, and um, like, it's, it's super easy to use, and it gives you a lot of cool powers, and it also, it's also what powers a lot of how you do uh, theming and stuff with a lot of the new frameworks. So, uh, how, you do, how you do it with um, web components or Polymer and, and other frameworks as well. So, for the longest time, this was a sad story. So, like, uh, being able to actually outline something like this with CSS was more or less just impossible. Like, you should wrap things, and then if it was different on mobile, you should wrap them differently, and, like, it was just impossible. But, but you know, fortunately, uh, as of uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we now have CSS grid and uh, grid support in most browsers. Uh, and it's, it's so simple, like, it, uh, there's, there are a couple of different ways to, to uh, like, a couple of different syntaxes to actually write the code, but it's relatively simple. So you say the container is a grid, uh, and the, men the menu is then spanned, uh, so one-third of the width and uh, one, two rows on the height, uh, and the same goes for the top, and, you know, it's, it's kind of simple to get started with, and it's super powerful, and uh, these are just four elements in the DOM right after each other, no wrapping nested. Uh, needed, so it's 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 super easy, uh, and here you see I put a, a YouTube link in uh, on the slide as well. So if you want to learn this, uh, um, Rachel, something I forgot her last name, she did a really good tutorial, uh, and uh, and you should go follow it. It's a playlist of I don't know 20 short videos on uh, uh, on CSS Grid, and uh, you should really learn it. It's it's super awesome. Houdini, uh, everybody heard of anybody heard of Houdini for CSS? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not talking about the magician here, uh, but uh, but so Houdini is. I think it's maybe it might be named after the magician though, because it is kind of black magic. Uh, so CSS, you know, where you do stuff like this, and you say so the the, the transform should be translate some pixels, like even though that feels kind of weird, but you you can understand it. Uh, but then when you ask for it afterwards, it's suddenly a matrix with, uh, like, uh, CSS is just weird like that. And uh, that's what Houdini kind of wants to, uh, to, to take away. Uh, all the making numbers into strings and taking them back to numbers to do math with them and, uh, and actually understanding what happens when you do uh, calculations and stuff. So we'll, uh, like, I, I won't go into this for too much for the, for the sake of time, but you see, like, you can, you can make a style map and actually set the height and say, uh, here, the CSS uh, uh, pixel value is actually a number and not part of a string anymore. Uh, and the same goes for, uh, you can do calculations, you say, where I say, so we should do 50 view uh, height um, and uh, minus 20 pixels, so that would be how you do CSS calculations. And it's, it's, it's a lot easier to, get to, uh, to actually work with this way. Um, this is nowhere near landing in any browser anytime soon. Uh, but it's uh, uh, but it, but it's kind of cool and it's 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 awesome to see uh, where we're going and that and that like it's awesome stuff is on the on the us on the roadmap as well uh, and like it goes on if you want to do a really complex uh, animation stuff you can do that as well there are APIs for uh, listening to cert only certain events and then updating only certain parts of the UI and like you can do very complex stuff with this and you should like the more information you give the browser the more guarantees you give it the, f the faster it will be the, the more performant it could be. So this code won't work anywhere either but it, this was just going to be how kind of how it will look maybe. Um, yeah uh, more of that. So then there's Internet of Things obviously. Uh, and the physical web thing. So, like, there's already, a, as I mentioned, there's a lot of APIs that are standards that are, you know, from the W3C, how to work with gyroscopes and magnometers and ambient light sensors, and there's uh, APIs for all of them. They're in the standards, and, and that's super awesome. But I thought we should talk about something, uh, something real, and uh, I, actually have, I actually brought s something just because I wanted to show something that's, uh, that, that you can do today. So... If this works, we'll see a, a Bluetooth lamp. So this is just a, like a regular uh, LED bulb 
where you can change colors on it. It's, can you see it if it's here? OK. Um, and I built a little uh, piece of code. Maybe I should show you the code first. So the code kind of looks like this. So on the navigator object, there's now a Bluetooth uh, property where you can say request device and say what kind of device you're looking for. So here I'm looking for uh, a service with this ID and a name of the bulb. Uh, and obviously, this would change if it, if it was a different manufacturer or whatever. But like, then I, it's based around promises again. So I get a device, I, get, I connect to it, I get a server, I get a service from the server, I get a blah, 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 blah. And then by the end of it, I get characteristics. And characteristics is what it's all about, because here you can say write value. And uh, then I'll just write red, green, and blue value for the, for the lamp. And uh, it'll change colors. So uh, like if, if we're lucky, this will work. So I'll try to drag this over here. This is stable Chrome, so there's no magic here. This is all the stuff that's in the browser already. Um, it's up on GitHub. You, you, can, you can just go ahead and try it. If you buy one of these, they're like $10 or something for, for LED. It's so much cheaper than Philips Hue or whatever kind of color lamp you want to have. Um, I click the, the change color. No. Let me just reload the page. I click the find bulb button. Here's, a, here's, a, here's my LED. I click pair. I get sliders. So this is just the beautiful UI that I've made. I'll press uh, change color, and the light changes color. So it's like, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, I, thought, I just thought it would be fun to actually show something that has a real meaning to it. And it's not just in the future. So this is stable browsers today. And it's, uh, you should go play with that. Yeah. Um, then there's the physical web. Uh, if you've been sitting over in this part of the, part of the, the section today, uh, I've had a couple of people come up to me and they're like, so what is this NG Aarhus thing? Uh, which was the name of my user group locally. Uh, and, uh, and, and why do I get push notifications about it? And uh, it's not really a push notification. It is a notification, though. I've been carrying around some of these uh, beacons. Uh, these are Edistone beacons. Um, and uh, yeah, like we've been able to do beacons for apps for years, uh, but now it's actually coming to the web. And uh, Eddystone beacons, they just broadcast a URL. So it's so simple. They don't do anything except they say, so this is me. Uh, I, these are configured, so you, you probably won't even uh, reach them out here because I want battery life. Um, but like, if you're close to me, or you can come close to me afterwards, it'll show up on your phone, and, uh, and it'll, it'll just show up and say, so you want to see the program for today's meetup, because that's what I use them for. Uh, and um, yeah, it's so, it's so cool. It's, it's cool new technology, uh, and it's in uh, stable Android today as well. Uh, it's on Chrome for iOS as well, uh, even though the, the integration is not as, well, uh, as good there. But these should be everywhere. Like, I mean, everywhere where you used to be able to, you used to have to download an app, an, uh, like a native app, uh, to do something, even though you only had to do it once, you have to download a 100 megabyte app. Uh, no, like that's the power of the web. Like you can, you can go to a website, it's there for you. Uh, it can work offline, you can receive push messages. And we can even broadcast the URL to the, to the web app for you. So imagine, uh, like, you add a bus stop, and the bus will, like, we took up, you take up your phone, and it'll actually say, so the, get the ETA for the bus right here on your phone. So you don't have to install anything, it's just right out of the pocket. I think this is live in uh, buses in London, um, at least in some bus places. Um, and you can imagine it actually doing more complex stuff. So this is a parking meter uh, that broadcasts a URL. You click the button, you're loaded into a progressive web app where you can pay for parking. So, like, super, super cool stuff that, like, if I'm a tourist and I know I'm only going to park here one day, why would I install an application for that? Like, uh, that's, that's, the that's what the web is for. Yeah, then there's web VR. I brought a, I brought a, a Google Cardboard as well. If you, if, if, like, if you haven't tried them, uh, you should come uh, try mine afterwards. It, I mean, it's a, it's a $5 piece of cardboard. But you put your phone in it, and you can do virtual reality. Like, it's super simple. Uh, you should. Like, come play with it if, if you haven't tried it. I'll give you some, some, some funny URLs. If you go to webvr.info, you can see more. Uh, you can see demos and stuff. If you go to the A-Frame uh, page, uh, that's a library for, for building uh, web VR stuff, because it's still kind of hard. The APIs are a little bit weird. Uh, but yeah, go, go, uh, go try it out. Yeah, looks like this. So, you know, monoscopic thing. So you have two eyes. Uh, it works with hardware today. Uh, 
they're in the browsers with the, with the polyfill. Uh, at Google I.O. a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a lot of talk about web VR and how it's now about to be native and, you know, a lot of cool stuff going on. We'll have better performance, more hardware access, even more. Uh, cool stuff. Yes, it, it runs 60 frames per second. Yeah, come try it afterwards. So, the last thing now that I'm almost out of time is uh, WebAssembly. So, we've been, like, we want to do, we want to have the, the power of native. We want that for our web apps. Um, but, you know, the, the web still, like, it's JavaScript, it, it, it's, it, like, it's come to a place where it's kind of fast, but it's, not, it's still not as fast as, as, as native code. And that's what WebAssembly uh, is about. So the idea of WebAssembly is that you can take a, a, an application written in C or whatever, all the language, and you can actually compile it down to uh, an assembly that you can run on the web. So imagine this. Uh, the next Photoshop, the next Final Cut, the next very serious, like with a lot of uh, CPU and GPU powers, the next kind of that application could be on the web. Like all the UI could be built with web. All the, all the, all the interactions could be built with web. The web is probably better for that. It's, kind of, it's, it's used to all the scaling issues and the multiple platforms and all that stuff. And, and then every time you have to do some heavy computational work, you can do it with WebAssembly. So the idea of WebAssembly is that you, you, can, you can take your C libraries, you can convert them into WebAssembly, and then you can call them directly from JavaScript and interact with them like they were classes from, from the same language. So uh, super cool new stuff. Um, yeah, so obviously it's not a language that you're going to write yourself. It's a compiled to language. Uh, there are some demos here. Uh, you should go try the Tanks demo. It's uh, like where they ported a game uh, into WebAssembly and it runs in the br browser. It's kind of fun. Uh, yeah, don't think of it as a, as a new language. Uh, just think of it as, as you gaining even more superpowers to, to have really performant code. So I'm about done now. So as you, I hope I've showed you that I think the platform is pretty cool. So there's a lot of new features uh, that are coming or that are already here. Uh, let's embrace it. Uh, use the platform. Thanks. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Yes. If the service worker keeps running after the session ends, when will it stop? Uh, also, where does it live? Uh, so where it lives, it depends on the platform. So like, if, it's on, uh, if it's on Android, it actually runs in like a, like a, a regular Android back background service, um, like you can do with regular Android apps. Uh, it's a little bit different on uh, on Mac and uh, and Windows, I believe. I think they fixed it now, so you can actually also in close the the Chrome instance, not just the Chrome window. Uh, but I think it should be uh, it should be everywhere uh, available now. Um, obviously, for for performance reasons, it doesn't really run in the background. Uh, so it's it whenever you, it's not used, it will the browser will will tell it to go to sleep. Uh, and then the browser will, will be the one that's actually listening for events, and when the events come in, it will wake up your service worker. So you can't store any state in your service app worker, you should store it all in IndexedDB or something, because you can't, you can't expect for memory to be the same when, when the service worker wakes back up. And another note to say about this, if maybe I should go back to the slide. <sighs> A lot of slides. <laughs> so, you see, uh, when, when we listen for any event, uh, in the callback we get an event, and every time I call event.waitUntil, uh, and then gives it a promise that, uh, that will then resolve when, the, when my action is done. And that's so that the, the browser won't kill it while it's still doing stuff. So while we're waiting for the network to respond or something, the browser won't kill it, uh, so it doesn't know what to do with the response. So we call event, event that wait until, and that gives us a guarantee that until this promise fulfills or fails, um, that the, the service worker will, will stay awake. Yeah, long answer to that question. Uh, how are you working with both Angular and Polymer? Which one do you prefer and why? So um, I know... Uh, I know uh, big corporations that use Polymer for, uh, because of, like, it's so small and it, it's, it has a really good um, 
story about you know reusing uh, parts of the UI or or of your visual identity or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it's really powerful for that, and then you can use it with Angular, with React, with Vue, with whatever, because it's just like it, it's just like a, a native web component. Um, so that that would be a, a good way to handle it. Uh, you can use both. Uh, you ca you can you can build entire applications with Polymer, uh, although. Pff, I, I kind of I, I kind of don't like it, but but I like just building individual components with it. Uh, so yeah, but you could if you wanted to. When you worked with Light, ah, that went away. Uh, what structure do you have on the projects with Purple? Uh, again, it's not a it's not a it's not a framework. It's 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 a methodology. So like, the idea is kind of that. There are some best practices. There are some ways to to make your your page loads load faster uh, and give a better user experience, and uh, and that's kind of what what, what Purple is, is trying to to you know to generalize in a way so we can talk about it. So it's 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 more of a tool of uh, being able to say, are you pushing your resources? Are you uh, preloading? Are you lazy loading? Are you all that stuff? So it's it's uh, like how you would. Uh, Concretely uh, do it, and if you should do all of it or just some of it, it depends on the situation. So, and on your back end and on, on the front end on everything. Uh, since there are still browsers that don't support HTTP2, uh, did you set up the build output to produce two builds, or what did you do? Um, actually, it's kind of fun that HTTP2 is it's one of the only features that I can think of where the browsers were the first to implement, and all like there was nobody using it for a lot of time for a long time, uh, and um, so browser support for HTTP/2 is actually really good. Uh, but obviously, like if you have to support all the browsers, you, you might run into uh, to issues with it, and uh, and uh, yeah, you could do two builds, or you can just say so. If you don't support HTTP/2, you can just like. It should you should be able to like with preloading or w with pushing resources or with multiplexing like you should just it could be able to just fall back to regular HTTP one and still work uh, probably a lot slower if you're you know getting ev individual files individual modules by individual files uh, uh, but yeah you should do it it should should be, should work uh, when you work with Lighthouse for the custom elements did you use polyfills. Uh, or what did you use for browser support? Uh, I don't. I don't think Lighthouse has anything to do with it. But uh, so custom elements. Yeah, uh, there's uh, like if you want to use custom elements and you want to have uh, uh, old browsers support it, uh, there's a pretty uh, pretty decent um, uh, polyfill, uh, and it's actually uh, so. S I think about a month ago, maybe two months ago, uh, iOS. Uh, some version uh, came out uh, where iOS is actually supporting uh, most of the features, and that's the uh, that's the biggest issue we've had with with native web components was iOS. Uh, so now the only thing that's not supported on iOS uh, um, uh, for uh, for web components, I, I think, is the HTML imports w uh, part, and that's uh, probably being taken out of the spec again because they they can't really figure out how it's how they should do it. Uh, but even like, if you want to use the syntax that's in the spec today, uh, the the polyfill is like nothing. So uh, yeah, go with the polyfill if you if you need to. Uh, the polyfill works uh, really well. You can there's a, a very lightweight polyfill uh, that you, that gives you most of what the what the API uh, the native APIs uh, give you. So if you if you don't use the, all the weird edgy corners of of the APIs, you should go for the very small polyfill. But if you do, there is a, a very complex, very large, kind of slow polyfill that gives you everything. So that depends on your situation as well. Why LinkedIn and other big apps dumped HTML5 and native for mobile apps? Uh, when we should choose to stay? Well, I think, um, I think when, uh, like, it was so famous when, uh, when, uh, when Facebook did their HTML5 thing and Mark Zuckerberg was like, HTML5 is crap and, and all that stuff. Uh, it's been a couple of years since then, and the browser's really caught up. Uh, it's it's really interesting to see that uh, uh, if we take Twitter, Twitter's just launched the new, uh, I think it's called, I think it's uh, mobile.twitter.com or something, in, which is a progressive web app that has all the stuff that we need, that we talked about. So it, it loads after the purple pattern, it works with offline, it does, uh, it makes, you, you, can, you can do, uh, you can send, uh, 
tweets when you're not online, and it will send it when you're back, back online. And it does everything that we've talked about. It's so simple, it's so smart, and loads so fast. Like it, it, it outcompetes their app on any platform. Uh, and uh, I think that's kind of the point of it. Like they've realized um, on Android, where you can you can install and you can do offline and all that stuff. Uh, I think they're they're gonna they're gonna skip the the, the, the native app. I think it's gonna be the web app for uh, for most platforms. It's probably gonna be a while uh, before they'll they'll kill their iOS app because iOS support for progressive web apps is not so good. Uh, and uh, maybe that's the the <laughs> the, qu the question uh, the second question. Uh, so iOS is um, they're coming around like at uh, at WWDC, at Apple's developer conference uh, this week or last week, they announced support for some of the features that we've been wanting. Uh, they came with some of the features for web components, uh, but they're still they're still lacking some some of the features. And I, I I mean, the whole idea of calling it progressive web apps is that you build a fantastic web app that's just a regular web app that will work everywhere. And then if your browser supports it, you get to do offline, you get to do push messages and all that stuff. And that's it, I see. So uh, thanks for having me. I think we'll have a break. Yeah, thank you so much. Amazing.